So MLA citations, that's what we're talking about today. Uh, first things first, Owl Purdue, okay? Owl.purdue.edu is where you need to go. You can just, I, I don't even go to the website. I just Google it every time. I always Google Owl Purdue MLA, which, for, which is the MLA format, right? Or you can do Google M Owl Purdue APA if you're going to be doing APA research papers in the future for other classes. But go to Owl Purdue MLA, you can Google it, or owl.purdue.edu. Um, and make sure you, if you click, if you Google owlpurdue.mla and you click on the first link, which is from owlpurdue.edu, then it will take you to a web page with like an outline on the left. And it's got a whole bunch of different stuff, but it should take you or pretty nearly to the basics for MLA. So that's where I get my information for this PowerPoint, uh, which you can look at later. Olivia, you have a question? Put what on my score? Yes, I can do that, definitely. Um, okay, so this is the best source for updated information about what exactly MLA format requires of you in whatever year you're doing it. Because by the time you get to college, and this is a college prep school, by the time you get to college, the requirements for MLA will have changed. Okay, there's going to be updates. So everything I'm giving you now are the basics the fundamentals uh, when it comes to citations. We've already done other things in, in MLA, but when it comes to citations, both in-text citations that you write in your paper and the work cited page, which goes at the end. So I'm giving you the basics for those. It's your job to get into the details uh, for the sake of knowing what to do when you get to college. Uh, for this class, for this grade, for now, I'm only requiring what I go over in this PowerPoint, okay? All right, so, but Owl Purdue is the best place to go for updated information. It's clear, it's easy, it's um, the same website I used when I was in high school. So, MLA in text citation, let's talk about the basics. Uh, in MLA style, referring to the works of others in your text is done by using parenthetical citations. Um, you know, what? I'm going to put the PowerPoint up there. So MLA in text citations, uh, that's the first part. And then we'll talk about the works cited page. In text citations, as far as the basics go, uh, for MLA style, it refers to the works of others in your text by using parenthetical citations. So when you're writing and you give a quote or you uh, paraphrase a section of what an author wrote, uh, you're going to need to reference who the author was for that quote or that paraphrase. So again, it's not just if you use quotation marks, but it's if you reference something that an author wrote. Uh, um, let me... There we go. Oh, it's recording the wrong one. All right, can you guys see that PowerPoint? Okay, you're also seeing the screen recording program, but at least you can see the PowerPoint. All right, so uh, in MLA style, the uh, in-text citation refers to the works of other people who you're citing in your text by using parenthetical citations. That's There, that will be a little better. So some general guidelines include number one, the source type matters. So the fact that the what you're citing is coming from the internet or a book or a magazine or a DVD 
or an electronic source of some other kind or an internet article. All of that matters for how your citation is going to be done. We're going to cover some aspects of some of these, mostly print, um, but you'll need to go into how to cite things for specific sources that you find that you're going to use. Okay. Uh, secondly, every in-text citation must correspond to a source on the works cited page. So you cannot have uh, a citation in your text, in your essay, that does not have a corresponding full citation on the works cited page. And you cannot have a citation on the works cited page that doesn't have, that isn't being used at, with an in-text citation in the middle of your essay. So uh, you have to have both ways they have to correspond so neither one is alone yeah. so in-text citation for known authors when you're citing a source and you know who the author is uh, in a moment we'll get to unknown authors for this one the author's last name and the page numbers from which the quotation or paraphrase is taken must appear in the text and a complete reference should be should appear on the works cited page which is saying like they have to correspond with the works cited page for the in-text citation, if you know the author's name, though, you have to include the author's name somewhere. And there's different ways you can do that. So the author's name may appear in the text of your essay, as in what you write. Uh, this author refers to blah, blah, blah. Or you can, the author's name may appear in the parentheses of your in-text citation, and you don't actually have to reference the author that way. So you have some, some leeway to, to handle it how you want. So looking at examples... Wordsworth extensively explored the role of emotion in the creative process. 263. So 263, the in parentheses, the par parenthetical part is the in-text citation. Uh, so the page number for whatever work that is will always be in the in-text citation. You'll never have an in-text citation that doesn't have the page number uh, with some exceptions to that statement. But generally, that's what it's going to be especially if you're talking about print. However, the author has to be mentioned. So in this case, the writer of this essay, or of this example of the essay, uh, mentions the author, Wordsworth, in what they write. Wordsworth extensively explored. Uh, notice, though, that there's no quote here. Okay, so the next one. Wordsworth stated that romantic poetry was marked by, and then here's the quote, spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings, 263. So these are saying the same things, but one is a paraphrase and one is a quote. Both of them include a page number and both of them include the author's name outside of the parenthetical statement. So the last one, romantic poetry is characterized by spontaneous by the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. And then they place the quote, the author, Wordsworth, in the in-text citation in the parentheses with the page number. Uh, also notice that the the punctuation for the sentence does not come until after the in-text citation. Okay, that's super important. Uh, the only time that that, that doesn't happen, uh, two that I can think of, one is if the punctuation is necessary as part of w what you're quoting. So like an exclamation mark. Let's say you're quoting something where the author you're citing used an exclamation mark. And that's like essential for understanding part of what he said, all right, grasping the tone of what he said. Uh, and then you can place the, um, the punctuation inside. Um, but generally, it's going to go at the end. The second time is when instead of using the quote as part of your sentence, if you use a longer quote. So a longer quote, if it has uh, more than four lines of quoted portions in your text, then it needs to be its own separate paragraph. And that's not something we're covering today. But in that case, the punctuation will come at the end of the, the paragraph that you're quoting, and then the citation would go on the same line after the period. And you would not use quote marks in that, in that parenthetical um, paragraph. I'm sorry, not parenthetical, in that uh, quoted paragraph. So. Uh, that's different, but generally you're going to be quoting shorter phrases, which only last one or two lines maybe. And in that case, the, the punctuation comes after the parentheses. All right, so MLA in-text citation for unknown authors. So if, you don't, if you're not able to figure out who the author is, and if you don't know at first, you should try to figure out. So 
Uh, when a source has no known author, use a shortened title of the work instead of an author name. So place the title in quotation marks if it's a short work, such, a, such as an article, or italicize the title if it's a longer work. So like plays, books, television shows, entire websites, uh, and provide a page number if the page number is available. You must still include the full source on the works cited page which is applicable to all in-text citations. So that's that first point we made. You should always have a corresponding citation on the works cited page, uh, even if you don't have an author for it. So an example, uh, we see so many global warming hotspots in North America, likely because this region has, quote, more readily accessible climatic data and more comprehensive programs to monitor and study environmental change, end quote. And then the, since there's no author for this article that they're citing, uh, they're including a shorter name of the title. So possibly this title would have had impact of global warming and then a, like a, a colon uh, and then a, a longer explanation, a subtitle, right? So you would only include that first part, a shorter version of the, of the whole title. All right. Uh, what about citing the Bible? Because you're going to need to be able to support your essays with a biblical um, doctrine and evaluate your opinion based in, in light of it. So you'll be citing the Bible. And how do you do that? In your first parenthetical citation, so this is for specifically for MLA format, right? It could be different with a different format. But for MLA format, when you use parenthetical citations for your in-text citation, you want to make clear which Bible version you're using and underline or italicize the title. So uh, New King James Version would be in italics, right? Uh, as each version varies in its translation and we're quoting something, right? So we're, we're getting something word for word and so getting the right translation is going to be important so somebody else can look it up and see what you said and if you actually quoted it word for word correctly or not. Uh, and then the the, the italicized version, uh, followed by the book of the Bible, uh, followed by the chapter and the verse. Don't italicize or underline the chapter or the verse, only the, the version title. So here's an example. Ezekiel saw, quote, what seemed to be four living creatures, unquote, each with faces of a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. New Jerusalem Bible. Uh, I'm sorry, that's a typo. This should have been in italics, and it was, but when I copied it over, I lost the formatting. So, New Jerusalem Bible should be in italics. All right, notice also for Ezekiel, the, the book, they did the, sh the, um, the shorter version of it, which is fine, so you can do that. Okay, in-text citations for the Bible, more. Uh, if future references employ the same edition of the Bible that you're using in your essay that you're writing, then list only the book and chapter and verse, and you don't need to include the version. So that's here. John of Patmos echoes this passage, the Ezekiel passage, when describing his vision, Revelation 4, 6 through 8. So you don't actually have to say when describing his vision in Revelation 4, 6 through 8. You could, but you don't have to. Okay, so common sense and integrity. Uh, Common sense and ethics should determine your need for documenting sources. So how do I know if I should um, use an in-text citation and include it in my works cited page or not? Well, you do not need to give sources for familiar proverbs, well-known quotations. So like if, you're, if it's a well-known phrase that everybody knows this, this like quote, but it, it's always listed at, as anonymous, then you don't really need to include that. And as an author or anything like that. Um, so well-known quotations or common knowledge. For example, it is expected that U.S. citizens know that George Washington was the first president. So you don't need to go find a book that says that in order for you to say it in your paper so you can cite it, right? Uh, you just, everyone understands that George Washington was the first president. So remember that citing sources is a rhetorical task and as such can vary based on your audience. If you're writing for an expert audience of a scholarly journal, for example, you may need to deal with expectations of what constitutes common knowledge that differ from common norms. So that's going to be really uh, important and, and applicable to this unit because we're going to be discussing controversial historical topics. And what everybody understands as common knowledge 
is exactly what we're trying to evaluate whether or not it is common, like it is accurate or not. So it's going to be really important for you to be discerning in what you cite and what sources you use to support what you say and whether or not you cite them. Uh, so the better your citations, the stronger your argument will be. Um, and that's just, that's really important to understand. But there is, there is a line. You don't need to cite whether or not George Washington was the first president. Okay, so the work cited page. Uh, aside from the, uh, the basics, I'm sorry, aside from the in-text citations, here are the basics for the work cited page. According to MLA style, you must have a works cited page at the end of your research paper. If you don't have a works cited page, then you just plagiarized is the point. Because all the citations you gave don't have a way for us to validate whether or not you said it. And so you're misusing what somebody said and that's plagiarism. So, uh, all entries in the works cited page must correspond to the works cited in your main text. So the format, how does the format look for your works cited page? Begin your works cited page on a separate page. So command or control enter. When you're done with your paper, it'll create a new page with a page break and that's where you start your works cited page. So if you edit your paper above, it'll always be on the next new page if you do a page break. Uh, it should have the same one inch margins and last name and page number header as the rest of your paper. So label the page works cited and do not italicize the words works cited or put them in quotation marks or bold them, don't make them a different size font. Everything on your MLA paper needs to be uh, Arial or Times New Roman size 11 or 12 font, okay? In my class, that's, that's either, any of those four is combinations is fine. Uh, but you don't bold the title, you don't do anything like that. Uh, and center the words works cited at the top of the page. So what does that look like? Uh, we'll get to that. Only the title should be centered. The rest of the the citations on your works cited page uh, should be aligned with the left margin, which we'll get to. So this is what it looks like. Uh, works cited, your page number. You should have your, depending on who you're writing for, um, you should have your page number right here and your name right here, okay? Um, but for my class, you're going to have your last name and your page number, which you should set up according to the rules, of the tools in Google Docs that we talked about before. And then works cited just like this. So uh, no quotes, no italics or anything. Okay, MLA works cited page, more on the format. Double space all your citations, but do not skip spaces between entries. So double space it by formatting it for double space. Don't double space by putting an enter in between each one. That's not double spaced, okay? Um, indent the second and subsequent lines, so second, and or third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, however lines you need for a citation that takes up. And then on the next new citation, it'll start over on the left margin. So you're going to indent the second and subsequent lines half an inch to create a hanging indentation. It looks like this. So we have the citation which starts on the first line. It's on the one inch margin right here. And then the next line for that specific citation is indented opposite of a paragraph, right? So a paragraph indents the first line and then subsequent lines are on the margin. Work cited is exactly opposite and it's called a hanging indentation because that first line hangs over top of the rest. So, uh, and then if you'll, oh, if you'll notice, um, some lines only take up one line. And in that case, the next line starts on the, on the one inch margin too. If any citation did take up more than two lines, then the third line would fall in line with the second at the half inch margin. Also notice, uh, here you can see the, the last name and page number. That's what it should look like. Okay, more on the format. List the page numbers of sources efficiently when needed. So if you refer to a journal article or a book that appeared on pages 225 through 250, then don't say page number 225 through 250. List the page numbers on your works cited page as pp.225 through 50. So the two is what's being repeated, right? So drop it in the second time. You don't need to. If you're repeating, um, let's say it's 1,225, then drop the one and the two 
11, 20, sorry, 12, 25 through 12, 50. Just do 12, 25 through 50. You drop whatever numbers are repeated. If only one page of print source is used, mark it with the abbreviation P as opposed to PP uh, before the page number, example P157. If a span of pages is used, mark it with the abbreviation PP before the page number. Okay? And again, notice how they, they didn't repeat the one. Capitalization. Capitalize each word in the titles of articles, books, etc. Do not capitalize articles like the or an. Prepositions or conjunctions, unless one of those is the word, is the first word of the title or the subtitle. So, gone with the wind. Notice with and the is not, or the art of war. The is an article, but it's the first word, so it's capitalized. There is nothing left to lose. Um, another example would be one of our re works that we're going to be reading it is called um, Southern Slavery. Okay, so neither of those is a is an article or a preposition. So southern and slavery are both capitalized. Um, but then the next one, uh, it's as it was, a s i t w a s. So it was is not capitalized, but as is capitalized because it's the first word in the subtitle. And so southern slavery capitalized as capitalized, and then it was is not capitalized. MLA works cited page for font and punctuation. Uh, use italics instead of underlining when it comes to titles of larger works like books and magazines and movies we mentioned earlier. And then use quotation marks for sh titles of shorter works like poems and articles um, or chapters of a book. So we can see that here. Uh, looking at the titles, right? Here is the author or the title of the story if there's no known author and then we have the title of the work compendium of theology that was the title of thomas aquinas's work uh, and it's in it's a larger work so it's in italics but if we come down more we'll see here uh hearst is was my professor and it's the format it was the type which was personal essay so i had to Remember I said the type of source is important. So in this case, it was a personal essay she wrote, and it's a shorter work. So it's in quotes, A Talking Cure for Temptation, part two of two. Uh, so, oh, here's another one. An article written by C.S. Lewis, uh, Religion, Reality, or Substitute. So this is a shorter article in a larger work, which is in italics, Christian Reflections. Uh, all right, so author's names. How do the author's names work? Entries are listed alphabetically by the author's last name or for the entire edited collection, editor's name. So depending on what you have to use, like if there's no known author, it's still going to be alphabetical. The author's names are written with the last name first and then the first name and then the middle initial or the middle name if whichever is needed. So some examples, Burke Kenneth. So his name is Kenneth Burke. Uh, Levy David M., M is his middle initial, and it comes after the first name, but the last name comes first with a comma. And then Wallace, comma, David Foster. Notice the only time that a period shows up in these here is when it's the middle initial. Other than that, there's no period used. Okay, uh, more on the author's names. There is a lot more that goes into formatting a works cited page, and you will need to research that on your own on the OWL Purdue website. So becoming familiar with that website is one of the most helpful things that you can do now to help you in your college experience later. Uh, and again, this is a college prep school, so my a large goal of mine in this class is to prepare you for the kinds of tasks you're going to be doing, whether that's reading, whether that's an analysis paper, if that's MLA format, any of that. I want to give you experience and to help you get really good at it. So you go into your college English class and impress your prof. That would be really exciting if that happened. So, All right. In doing so, in preparing that way, you will also learn the skills necessary for learning other formats, such as APA or Chicago style. Your profs at college may require those formats, and they will likely require APA if you're in any science major. Uh, and learning how to figure it out on your own is an important skill. All right. Does anybody have any questions about MLA format citations for in-text or your works cited page? 
All right, great. And that is it.